Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me just see if I can order this thing as tight as possible. And then hopefully we can get started with a little small Inyana tutorial. I think you guys actually want it without saying so. Okay. Okay, it does flick a little bit. I think we'll just have to handle it and run through it as best possible. Okay, so this little tutorial here is about the uh, pathophysiology of HIV, also previously called AIDS. But you know, um, if you take a medication, HIV doesn't necessarily have to progress to AIDS. Okay, so where do we get started? Firstly, the HIV virus itself. So, we're going to represent it something like this. This is not how it looks, this is just a visual representation for explanation purposes. So, this thing comes into you uh, one way of many ways. And most commonly, sexually transmitted. So, uh, it can be via blood transfusion, it can be by people sharing needles, our Bluetooth South African people. Uh, people taking the RP and then diluting it and then taking it back into or injecting uh, another person's own blood into them uh, obviously a major risk factor to getting HIV so somewhere or another this HIV virus has to enter your body if it's via needle prick or via a sexual intercourse with an with infected person anyway can work for it it just wants to get in you and start destroying your CD4 positive receptor CD your, C, your immune cells and CD4 receptors okay so just skip the entire process we got this antibody virus in us one way or another okay as soon as it enters it will seek out CD4 receptors so CD4 receptors aren't a certain cell kind it's the only receptor found on certain kinds of cells so most commonly we find them on our T helper cells these guys are like the balancers of your immune system or maybe let's say the, the, the managers of your immune system so they would call out different immune cells to come to the party so let's say uh, you have an infection they would release interleukin 3, interleukin 7, ETC and then they would call other immune cells with these chemokines so these chemokines would go out uh, via the lymphatic system or via your bloodstream and then go fetch other immune cells to come to the area or force the body to start producing more immune cells so they are the managers they say what they actually need to happen next we also find CD4 receptors on dendritic cells uh, if you can remember our dermatology lectures our dendritic cells are located within our skin and also within our epithel epithelium of our lungs and nasal mucosa so they usually recognize things that we get into contact with daily. So dendritic cells are normally the ones who would first create a response towards an allergen or so, or also to infections and other things that shouldn't be there. Dendritic cells are normal signal to upper cells, and then we start a reaction. Okay, so are we following here? We have CD4 receptors, we find them on dendritic cells, and we find them on the upper cells. And we also find them on macrophages. I, I wasn't supposed to do that, that was an accident. Okay, but macrophages. And if you know anything about immunology, you know macrophages are responsible for engulfing viruses, proteins and foreign antigens and destroying them. So macrophages normally contain certain enzymes, proteolytic, proteolytic enzymes and certain kinds of proteases that can more or less destroy most things we come into contact with. They're part of the innate immune response, so the initial immune response. As soon as we breathe in an organism, ETC, macrophages will engulf it and deal with it first. So the macrophages are normally present everywhere, but they can also be called by the helper cells. So let's say you breathe in a TB, a, a TB bacilli, for example. That bacilli will sit in the lung, and then your T alpha cells will eventually be activated and will create a lot of different interleukins and chemokines. And those chemokines will tell the lymphatic system to bring along macrophages to help you inhibit it so it doesn't grow in the area. So, if we remove that, then we remove a lot of our immune functioning. If we remove these free, these free cells, they really are important for our normal functioning immune system. Okay, so that was basically where CD4 receptors are located. Okay, and I wanted to have a beautiful picture here for you so I can explain it, but we'll just have to restart elsewhere on the page. Okay, so, um, that was a brief explanation of when we find the CD4 receptors. There's still much more things we need to discuss.
Okay, hopefully you can see better now. I'm trying to reposition this little guy. Okay, I think that's best. So, let's create a little HIV virus again. Uh, just visual representation purposes again. That's not how it actually looks like. But just so you have an idea. Okay. Let's say that's the virus. And let's say this is your CD4 receptor positive immune cell. So let's say this is a T alpha cell. The process will remain the same if it's a, uh, a dendritic cell, a macrophage, or a T alpha cell. Doesn't that make doesn't make a difference? And then we have a CD4 receptor here, and we have a CCR no CCR5 CCR5 receptor. I can't remember if it's CCR5 or 4 now. Okay, but there's two receptors on the cell membrane of a T alpha cell. Okay. Let's say this is a T alpha one cell. It normally deals with infections. Okay, now, we're just going to discuss the fusion first, the fusion of these two membranes by the receptors, how that actually happens, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail about how the HIV will then replicate itself within a cell. So, first things first, there is a GP120 protein here. We call it a GP120 protein. It's on the outer layer of the uh, viral envelope. This is a viral envelope. Uh, and we also have a GP41 protein here. So these two proteins are crucial for this virus to actually enter this cell. Remember, this is a virus that needs our cells to survive, and in this case, it's our CD4 receptor positive cells. So we'll get a GP120 binding to CDR, CD4. Okay, so I'm just zooming in this entire story. So I'm taking this little piece here, and I'm zooming it and creating it here. So the viral cells are much, much smaller. The viruses are much smaller than our own cells. Okay, so it binds them, and then there's a conformational change happening in this GP120 protein uh, and 41 protein. So then the GP41 protein will reach out and bind to the CCR5 receptor. And as soon as this happens, these two membranes can start fusing. Okay, so then they will start fusing. And that's basically all you need to understand for our purposes in PHC223. So, GP120 binds to CD40, or CD4, and then undergoes a conformational change which allows GP41 to bind to CCR4. Think of this as a little guy, and he has his arm. And as soon as, he, as, soon as the CD4 receptor binds, he, his arm becomes strong enough. A conformational change makes the arm strong enough so he can pull himself into, into the CD, into the T alpha cell here. Okay, so then these membranes will merge and everything on the inside here will be thrown out into the cell. And this is the most important part. So what do we find inside these viral cells? So just a quick representation. Okay, so what we normally find inside of these cells is a, this is a viral envelope and the GP41 and 120 proteins are around here somewhere on the outside. So this is a HIV, it's not a cell, virus, it's a virus, this is a virus. Okay viral envelope and then inside the viral envelope we find the viral capsid. So the viral capsid is basically a bunch of P24 proteins. P24 proteins. And then inside of this capsid we find two strands of the viral RNA and we also find the reverse transcriptase, integrase and protease. So what I need you to understand is that this virus brings along what it needs to start disrupting your own cell, or to start disrupting the DNA replication within your cell. It has everything it needs right here. Okay. These things come along. You have an idea. So, as soon as these two cells merge, like this, if you have this little picture here, or the diagram here, as soon as these two cells merge, this entire viral capsid that has P24 proteins around it here, will be thrown out into the T alpha cell or the dendritic cell or the macrophage. So as soon as that happens, the entire process can get started. Okay, but before we go too far, there are drugs that can inhibit CCR5, like Maraviroc. That's something new we found. And it's also drugs that can inhibit the, the fusion between these two membranes. That's called fusion inhibitors. Uh, the, one, the one example I have is infuvertide. Infu 
So the reason Infufatan isn't really in South Africa is because it's simply too expensive. And I do think we do use it as a salvage therapy, but I'm not really aware of it. Um, for you guys in your PhD 223, it's definitely not one of the most important things to learn. More important for you guys is just to know the basic life cycle and the basic first choices that we would use to treat the person with HIV. And the classification all depends on where it filters into the life cycle of HIV and where it disrupts the life cycle of HIV. So, okay, so first things first, these two fused via the, via the process I just explained earlier, this reverse if you can't remember, and then the viral capsule will be thrown out into the Stiapa cell. So all of these P24 proteins we saw here, all of these P24 proteins we saw here, what's happening to my video? Oh, just going too far. All of these P24 proteins, well, this will basically uh, degranulate out of each other, and then they will release reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease into the cell with the two strands, viral RNA strands. All right. So this is where we start. This is where uh, this is where all the pathology now starts. All of really, we had to enter first, so we could have inhibited the HIV from entering the CD4 receptor positive cell by using the Raviroc or by using Infuvertide. Infuvertide is extremely expensive. I think that's the main reason we don't use it in South Africa. The Raviroc is used now at the moment in salvage therapy. So as soon as a person has failed all of the other ARVs, they get a chance to use Raviroc. Okay, so those two aren't mainline things we use at the moment. The mainline things we use at the moment, we will go over now. Well, just the mechanism, nothing else really. Okay, so, let's get started. Let's go get, create a little mock immune cell for you, a little t upper cell again, uh, as big as possible. And let me maneuver this guy, so we can see the our immune cell. Okay, that's our immune cell. Okay, so inside this cell, uh, a lot of things are happening. You guys know we've got a nucleus with our own DNA inside of it. A double helix. This is all our DNA in here. And then we have uh, ribosomes, we have a Golgi apparatus, we have endoplastic reticulum, ETC, 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 a lot of things. So we won't design, we won't draw the things that we won't need now. So one fact I quickly want to mention as well as you guys should be knowing that this is a double phospholipid layer, or just a double lipid layer, most people call it. Very important for the HIV virus as well. Okay, so the HIV virus has entered here. So it's not the entire virus, it's the viral capsid that gets dropped inside of the cell. So the viral capsid consists of P24 proteins, which create the viral capsid structure, and of reverse transcriptase, of integrase, uh, integrase, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. Okay, so those things are now entered the cell with the two copies of the viral RNA. So first thing that this ingenious virus does, it uses its reverse transcriptase enzyme to start making copies. So it starts creating this viral RNA into viral DNA. So it'll take this viral RNA and it will pick up the nucleosides and nucleotides within the cell itself. So it pick up, picks up, um, I can't remember what you call them, you call them things like guanosine and cytosine, and I, I hope you guys can remember those building blocks. So it picks up these nucleotides and links them in. Then with this process, reverse transcriptase, let's call it RT for now, will then start creating full DNA strand. Okay, so normally our bodies would use DNA and from the DNA we create um, messenger RNA and eventually functional and structural proteins. So this reverse transcriptase actually takes RNA and works backwards towards DNA. So we started with a viral RNA here, now we have a viral RNA with a single strand DNA mixture. And this single strand DNA we just made, so the single strand DNA was made from uh, was made, was made by reverse transcriptase, picking up uh, various nucleosides and nucleotides and mixing them in with the viral RNA to make viral RNA DNA mixture. So, but you have to remember that only this the one strand is now the viral RNA and the other strand is viral DNA. So this viral DNA has successfully created 
or single strand viral DNA it's successfully created can now be incorporated into our own genetic genetic information so reverse transcriptase firstly did this and then after it did this it would it has two functions it has two ends this thing I can't exactly remember how to explain it to you guys so basically reverse transcriptase will create this and then it will chop it apart there and there okay so then it creates two sticky ends and these two sticky ends can then be integrated into our own genetic structure so firstly what I want to mention is so how can we counteract this process so we have things called nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors okay these are by far the most important drug classes for you guys to know in pharmacy PHE 223 they encompass most things that we use today so this is example tenofovir uh, tenofovir emitricitabine uh, lamuvidine zydovidine um, there's a lot it's really 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 a lot so but you just have to understand or just know about the the few main ones that we speak about so normally the main ones we speak about is tenofovir lamuvidine zydovidine abacavir and imitristabine those are the main ones currently that we we're busy with at the moment uh, mostly because of cost in south africa now we get them on tender for a good price so that's why everyone can have ARVs so these are basically like nucleo nucleosides as soon as we take these tablets our bodies they will then lie here within our cells and they would act as chain terminators so instead of this thing this vital RNA creating a complete viral viral RNA single strand DNA mixture it will never be able to because this abacavir or this lamuvidine or this tenofovir would basically act as a nucleoside and when reverse transcriptase wants to integrate uh, this abacavir which looks like a nucleoside to it into the viral RNA it will do it but then it won't be able to put another end here so it will start doing the chain here and but it won't be able to link the chain together because this thing contains uh, a non-reacting functional group at the side where normal nucleosides and nucleotides would react to each other and bind together into a single row now this row can't actually bind together and then we get chain termination so if you look at this thing it looks like a chain if we had a nucleus uh, a back over here this chain would never have been created okay so that's our first step how we normally deal with uh, uh, reverse trans transcriptase inhibitors so nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors a back over the movie into north of her there's a lot of them then we get non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and then we only have two ones so if a virus oh, we have more than two but these are the two ones that are important for us in South Africa if our virus and the virapine okay can you see yeah I, hope you, I think you can see so these are the two main non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors we have in South Africa so what they is they simply bind to reverse transcriptase and inhibit its function so if we inhibit reverse transcriptase from creating the viral DNA we have no problem then it can't go and replicate itself okay so now in this case let's say we didn't have any NRTI in here we didn't have any NRTI in here and now we got stuck so this viral RNA was successfully created in the scenario I'm trying to make up now or in a scenario where you did not take your medication so it will travel to the inside of it'll travel to the inside of our nucleus where our genetic material is and it'll find a certain piece there that will replace so then integrase comes into action integrase will take this uh, take this viral DNA strand and it will fit it into our genetic structure um, I hope I hope you follow as I'm explaining I see it's not a, it's not very uh, not a very color, colorful um, thing I'm creating here maybe we do this okay so let's quickly just zoom in let's say this is the nucleus now so this was the cell now we're going into the nucleus okay so inside the nucleus itself we've got our own genetic information which runs like this and now we've got the viral DNA RNA mixture which will look like this according to that little one we had earlier okay 
So this is now viral RNA and viral DNA. This can now be incorporated into our own genetic information. So integrase will come and integrase will snip a part there and snip a part there. It will snip two parts there and then it will incorporate this viral DNA into our own DNA. So, so far we used reverse transcriptase and now we used integrase, but reverse transcriptase we used and we used integrase so far. Okay, so reverse transcriptase was used to make this and integrase is used to actually incorporate it into our own genetic structure. So as soon as it's incorporated here, our body is completely blind. It sees it as its own thing. So nothing can destroy it as soon as this has happened. And now every single time something activates our own DNA to start creating some uh, necessary functional structural protein or maybe some receptor that should be on the cellular surface every single time we want to create something of the DNA this section will become activated and it will start making long proteins so okay so basically it will create mRNA, mRNA will travel outwards so the mRNA will contain the information now that uh, the virus is implanted into us here. And this mRNA will translate for various proteins at the ribosomes and the, I think it was the Golgi apparatus, doesn't really matter. So it will start creating these long chains of proteins. So these round things I'm making here are simply proteins. So these will be created in response to, well, mRNA taking a message to the ribosomes and creating this. Okay. So then, this thing now, this long strand of protein here, is completely useless to the virus. So it will be, for example, this is the information for reverse transcriptase. This has the information for um, okay, reverse transcriptase, information for integrase, information for protease. But what is protease? As a protease is basically a little man with a meat cleaver. He comes along. Okay, now I'm just trying to make a little knife here. Oh, that's a meat cleaver. He comes along and he snips apart these various pieces. So they become functional proteins. As long as they're in this chain here, they're completely useless. As soon as protease chops them apart, they become useful. And now these various proteins can actually do their function. So, so for the, in, in kind of... Oh, this can be a P24 protein, for example. I just want to put things into perspective of what's created here. So firstly, two viral RNA strands come in, and then reverse transcriptase makes them into viral DNA strands. Viral DNA strands are incorporated via integrase into our own genetic structure. Then viral protease comes, which is this guy, protease, comes and it snips the proteins apart to create functional proteins. And then at the end, we end up with reverse transcriptase, integrase, pro protease, two viral, viral RNA copies. As this process is happening, viral proteins are also, also being made. Viral RNA is also being made. And this is just simply added into the mix. So we have two copies. And we have a P24 protein. And we have the GP140 proteins, uh, GP41 and GP120 proteins. So the virus basically, what the virus did is, it basically took our own uh, DNA replication cycle and it completely hijacked it. Well, not completely, it hijacked a single piece of it. You can remember this piece here. It hijacked this piece of it. But this piece, this piece here, translates to the virus creating everything it needs to really infect another cell. So as soon as all of these things are made, they are encapsulized by P24. So reverse transcriptase, Reverse transcriptase, integrase, protease, and the two copies of the viral RNA are then encapsulated by P24. So P24 comes and locks everything around here. Remember, we're still inside the cell. So now let's create another cell. This will now be um, smaller. We will make this thing smaller now. And then oh, obviously the GP120s and the GP41s come all along the side here. Okay, so all of this is now neatly bundled together. So the HIV virus made this from our own genetic material. Genius. Then, now as soon as it wants to leave, it moves toward the outer membrane of the cell. So let's just quickly try it out and see if I can fit in here. I will next time use a much smaller book. It will be easier. Okay, now, let's say this is the red one. This is our own cell, our own 
Let's go look at it. This is our own cell membrane. So this is a CD4 cell, or it's a macrophage, anything with a CD, not a CD4 cell, a T helper cell, a macrophage, or a dendritic cell, which contains a CD4 receptor. Okay? So but this why this one has already been infected. This is just a piece of it. So this entire CAT2TB made up here, this one. Um, the viral capsid. This is basically the viral capsid with uh, rever uh, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease in, in the viral RNA copies with the GP120-140 proteins. Or 40 proteins, 41 proteins. So all of them kind of bundled together here. Yeah. They all bundled together. And they start moving outward. And as they start moving outward, they basically steal a piece of this membrane. So then you get the capsid surrounded. You get the capsid surrounded by a double phospholipid layer. And then you get the GP41 and GP41 and GP120 proteins poking out the sides like this. Okay, and as this thing matures, this is now a fully functioning HIV virus, well, HIV virus. As soon as this thing leaves the lymphocyte or the TH cell or the macrophage or the dendritic cell, that can, that can now go and bind to another CD4 receptor and restart the entire process in another cell. And do you think that this process only happens once, like I explained here? I'll just quickly make one example for you. This process uh, with the HIV virus creating, this, the creating itself and multiplying itself happens billions of times per day. So eventually, this will, com this will translate to our viral load in our blood being high. And all the CD4 cells that undergo billions of trans uh, billions of well, the undergo this hijacking process by the HIV will eventually die off and then they would release the P24 proteins to the outside and this is what we test for when we test HIV initially, the rapid test and then our bodies will create antibody against it later but uh, I think just for the life cycle this is important ok, so this process leads to thousands and billions and I think it's billions of HIV viruses being created and then these can go infect more CD4 receptor positive cells anywhere in the body. So if we are not controlling this process well by inhibiting the steps in the viral replication, our viral load will obviously skyrocket. Viral load will skyrocket. And all of the CD4 receptor positive cells will obviously rock bottom. Because as this process is going on, this cell will eventually be, be destroyed by this process hijacking it. It won't be able to create its own proteins and uh, well, its own proteins it requires for replication. Uh, proteins it requires also for just uh, maintaining itself. Those won't be there. So eventually the cell will just degenerate and die. Then the P24 will be released and that's what we test for. That's why there's also a week's delay when we're testing for HIV. You won't test, if, you, if I give you HIV now, you won't see it immediately. We'll only see it in about a week's time. Because we're testing for this, the presence of this P24 protein. And then, if you want to rule, if you if you if you want to double check your diagnosis, you need to you need to use the ELISA test. The ELISA test is basically an antibody test, an antibody test that tests for the antibodies we create against this P24 protein. Okay, but this only happens two to four weeks after the infection. Also, depending on your inoculum, how big amount of virus you got into your body in the first place. And that's the very basics of it. Um, I think we've covered if a virus. Oh, I didn't say about protease. Obviously, uh, the protease that snips the virus, you know, is the guy with the axe. There he is, the guy with the axe. Obviously, um, this protease can also be inhibited by things like ritonavir, lupinavir, and there's a few other ones as well. But ritonavir and lupinavir are the most important ones for us. Okay, most important ones for us. Yes, so when they inhibit this protease, the virus can never create functional proteins out of this long chain. So it will just be a long chain that lies within our own T alpha cells and it won't do anything ever. So without protease, the viral life cycle can't be completed. So all of these different steps that we inhibit eventually lead to lower viral load, increased CD4. And that is the main goal of therapy here. Okay, bye bye.